What will it take for you to believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist? We ask this question of Catholics and non-Catholics alike. What is stopping you from accepting the scriptural-based claim of the Messiah, the second person of the Trinitarian God? Is it because accepting this claim means changing the fundamental beliefs upon which your life is based? For Catholics, this would mean a new deep reverence and awe, a marked change in their reception of the Holy Eucharist, a renewed understanding of the Mass as being not a meal, but the representation of the sacrifice at Calvary, and possibly a change in many lifestyle choices. For non-Catholics and even non-Christians, this would mean tough decisions that need to be made. Yet this often perceived wild claim was made by our Lord Himself. He did not run after His disciples who refused to accept what seemed to be an unbelievable statement intolerable language as we read in scripture. The Catholic Church, the Bride of Christ, teaches that the bread and wine used in the Mass become the body, blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. This continues to be for many poorly formed Catholics a bold claim and a difficult teaching to accept, especially as it still looks, feels, smells and tastes just like unleavened bread and wine. Jesus himself experienced this kind of reaction, disbelief and doubt in what he had stated as truth. It is always important to look at the source of these texts and the language it was originally written in. The New Testament was written in Greek and not Hebrew or Aramaic as one might expect. We learn that Greek was the language used by scholars during the years 50 to 100 AD, the years when the New Testament was written. Throughout these verses, in John chapter 6 verses 23 to 53, the Greek text uses the word phago nine times. Phago literally means to eat or physically consume. Like the Protestants of our day, and sadly many Catholics too, the disciples had an issue with Jesus' literal usage of eat. They could only accept what they believed to be symbolism. How could he possibly instruct us to literally eat his body? In John chapter 6 verses 54 to 58, Jesus uses an even more literal verb translated as trogo, which means to gnaw or chew or crunch making the initial claim even stronger and clearer. We see how Jesus made no attempt to soften what he said, no attempt to correct misunderstandings. Our Lord had meant this literally. In John chapter 6 verses 60 we read, Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? In addition to theological and scriptural evidence, we see deeply compelling pieces of evidence that of the Holy Eucharist literally changing into Jesus' body and blood. And this has happened throughout the centuries. In the 8th century, a Basilian monk, doubting the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, was celebrating Mass. At the consecration, he saw that the host had changed into flesh. The wine had changed into blood and separated into five different sized clots. The priest then admitted his former doubts to the stunned parishioners. The Eucharist became flesh and blood before him. The flesh was a piece of human heart and the blood was human blood. It coagulated into five globules of different sizes which weighed the same as each other and the same as all five globules together. News spread 
and the faithful came from all over to witness this miracle. The relics have been contained in a silver and glass reliquary and are clearly visible and unchanged. The church investigated and declared this to be a Eucharistic miracle. And since then, several studies of the relics have revealed that the passing of so many centuries has done nothing to degrade or change the relics, even though they have never been sealed or preserved. So the latest scientific testing done in the 1970s confirms what the faithful have believed for 12 centuries without the technology of today. The flesh is real flesh, and it's a perfect slice from the heart. And the blood is real blood. The blood type is AB, the same found on the Shroud of Turin. Now moving on to another miracle which we found in 1263, where a German priest by the name of Peter of Prague was on a pilgrimage and stopped in Balsina, Italy, a town just north of Rome. He had recently been having doubts about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Was the bread and wine really transformed into the body and blood of Jesus? He celebrated the Mass at the Church of St. Christina. As Father Peter raised the host at the consecration, blood started flowing out of it onto his hands and the altar. Here was a clear message from God putting to rest all of the priest's doubts. Father was confused and tried to hide the blood. After Mass, he went to see Pope Urban IV and told the pontiff everything. The Pope ordered that the host and blood-stained altar cloth be brought to the cathedral at Orvieto, where they are still enshrined today. It is said this, that this miracle prompted Pope Urban to have St. Thomas Aquinas to write prayers for a Mass celebrating the most holy body of the Lord, the Feast of Corpus Christi. Now, on February 16th, 1266, in Santarem, a young woman overcome with jealousy for her husband met with a sorceress who advised that she go to the church and steal a consecrated host to use for a love potion. The woman did as she was told and stole the host. She hid the Holy Eucharist in a linen cloth. Frightened, she ran home and opened the cloth. Amazed, she then saw the blood was gushing from the host. Overwhelmed and not knowing what to do, she hid the sacred host in a drawer in her bedroom. That night, the drawer began to emit brilliant rays of light, lighting up the room as if it were daytime. A husband noticed too the strange phenomenon, and the young woman told him everything. The couple informed the pastor who removed the host from their home and returned the Blessed Sacrament to the Church of St. Stephen in solemn procession, accompanied by many religious and lay people. The host bled for three consecutive days and was then placed in a beautiful reliquary made of beeswax. 74 years later, in 1340, another miracle occurred when the priest opened the tabernacle, he found the beeswax vase broken into many pieces. In its place was a crystal vase containing the blood mixed with the wax. The sacred host is now preserved in an 18th century Eucharistic throne above the main altar. The couple's home became a chapel in the year 1684. These miracles confirm the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And they're not just confined to centuries in the past, they are still occurring in our present time. And that's why we're going to look at the more recent miracle, 12 years ago to be exact. In October 2008, the parish of St. Anthony Sokotka in Poland, a consecrated host accidentally fell to the ground during Mass, and when the priest noticed it, he believed it was dirty, and so placed it into a vasculum. This is a small container filled with water.
to dissolve it and get rid of a dirty host in the proper manner. Later when it was brought out again, although it was partially dissolved, it was still there and what was thought to be dirt at a passing glance was in fact what looked like a blood clot. Intense study followed and two scientists of global fame and specialists in pathological anatomy at the medical university were called in to lead the investigation. The two scientists studied the blood clot independent of each other making use of the most modern optical microscopes and the transmission electro electronic microscope. To further ensure no bias in the study, Professor Solkovsky was not informed that the sample which he was examining came from a host. Despite this, both scientists reached the same conclusion. The sample examined was neither a clot nor blood. It was a human cardiac muscle tissue and was still alive. The details of the heart condition are all the same as those we have mentioned earlier. But the most incredible thing about this study was that due to the advanced nature of the equipment they used, they were able to observe that the cardiac tissue was joined to the consecrated host in an inseparable manner. There is no scientific explanation for this. They penetrated each other as if a fragment of bread had suddenly transformed itself into body. It is not possible to manipulate an event of this type. No one, absolutely no one, would have been able to do it. Even the scientists of NASA who have had at their disposal the most modern analytical techniques would not be able to artificially recreate such a thing, affirmed the professor. Faith, of course, should not be based on miracles alone. Several of the recorded miracles are very old and it may be possible to dismiss them. There is no doubt though that reports of these miracles have strengthened the faith of many in the instructions given by Christ and provided avenues for contemplation of the miracle that takes place at each Mass. The translation of these reports will permit more people to learn of Eucharistic miracles and like others before, have their faith in Jesus' teaching through His Church strengthened. And remember, fight the good fight and keep the faith.